Okay, great. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Tarek Kalmakar, an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry, and I'm, I welcome you all to the sixth lecture of the SciTech SPIN series, an academic outreach program organized by Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. The purpose of this uh, monthly lecture series. Okay. So, um, today we have with us uh, Professor Kedar Khare, who, will be, who is a professor in the Department of uh, Physics. And he'll be talking to us about um, um, uh, an exciting topic, which I is think, uh, from funny. light waves to image. Yeah, and a uh, little bit of background of Professor Khare. Professor Khare um, completed his uh, five years uh, integrated master's in physics from IIT Khadak. Okay. Just quickly um, hand it over to Professor Khare. And uh, I simply, I just say two sentences that Professor Khare is the professor in the Department of Physics, and uh, he did his PhD uh, from United States. Okay. And in 2011, he joined uh, IIT Delhi as, a, uh, as an assistant professor in the Department of Physics, and now he is a professor at the newly created Optics and Photonics Department at IIT Delhi. And today he'll be talking about uh, a topic, uh, and the title of the talk is From Light Waves to Images. So, over to you, Professor Tarek. Thank you very much, Tarek. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, let us uh, today discuss uh, an interesting topic, uh, which is on imaging uh, as a research area in itself. Uh, you know, this is somewhat of a unusual topic for a science department, but I think uh, the way uh, things are moving in science technology, imaging is becoming very, very important and it is uh, kind of everywhere. And so I thought that uh, as I talk with uh, all the students attending this across India, uh, this could be a very nice uh, topic to introduce. Uh, you know, uh, they can look up to this kind of uh, activities in future to pursue because it's an exciting field uh, with very, very wide uh, applicability scope. And there are a lot of people needed, uh, particularly in India to uh, contribute to this area. So uh, when we talk about imaging, uh, let us see, uh, I would like to just put these pictures in front of you. And uh, uh, meaning whenever you read some uh, science articles, popular science articles, you can see this kind of pictures everywhere. They are also there in research journals, magazines, science, anywhere science is discussed, uh, pictures like this are also discussed. But just to give you a perspective, uh, you know, look at, uh, you know, I've just put three pictures here. There are a lot of things uh, which uh, for which uh, imaging is done, but I just wanted to uh, put the two extreme scales, okay? so. Here uh, on one side, we have a picture of a virus, uh, which is, you know, we are already talking uh, and strong scale kind of resolution. Uh, on the other side, other extreme, we have uh, something like a galaxy, uh, which is, you know, uh, 10 to 20 meters uh, kind of scales. So there is a, a huge uh, scale uh, span here, 10 to minus 10 to 10 to 20. So there is nothing uh, that is, uh, that much uh, of interest in science that a single area of science actually likes to look at all these scales. Okay, and 10 to 30 is a huge, uh, uh, you know, orders of magnitude. But the question I want to ask you is, uh, and the middle picture, as you can see, is a head scan, which is uh, closer to you know uh, lens scales of a human being. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, what I want to kind of uh, give you a perspective or think about is that. How do we actually form these mental pictures? I Meaning, you know, uh, all these pictures are important for our science and technology to grow. In fact, we can say that uh, if these pictures were not available to us, our science and technology, uh, you know, uh, it will not grow or it wouldn't have come to this level. And uh, secondly, the science technology cannot grow if uh, we cannot improve on these. Meaning, uh, today, if we have certain capabilities to generate these pictures. Uh, if tomorrow we cannot see anything more than that, then uh, to some extent our science will also stagnate. Okay, so uh, there is a big uh, implication for uh, what images can do for us. 
Historically, if you look at it, uh, you know, just the uh, invention of a microscope a few hundred years ago led to uh, the whole evolution of biology. Just uh, having telescope around, uh, you know, led to astronomy and then uh, so many, uh, you know, uh, so many of the early inventions and, you know, ideas in physics uh, were actually dependent on having that microscope there. Okay, so. If microscope was not there, Tycho Brahe wouldn't actually uh, note down positions of stars. There would be nothing for Kepler to analyze. And, you know, so you can see that whole uh, whole of our understanding about uh, universe has actually developed uh, to some extent because uh, people had access to imaging systems. And this story actually continues even today. Now, uh, you know, what I want to emphasize is uh, that, uh, you know, if you uh, look at these pictures, I mean, they all look like colorful pictures or this one is grayscale and whatever. Uh, but if you look at one pixel of each of these pictures, uh, it is actually the images represent uh, completely different physical quantities. Okay, so uh, how is a virus observed? It is observed uh, in an electron microscope. And uh, so if you uh, have a virus sample, you send electron beam onto it. And what you see here as a picture, uh, you know, or as a pixel values, uh, color coded in some sense, represents uh, you know, the, uh, the potential or Coulomb potential seen by the electron beam uh, as the beam uh, actually passes through this virus. Uh, meaning for the electron waves, uh, this virus is just like a transparent glass-like object, okay? Uh, here, if you look at uh, the head scan, as you can see in an MRI machine, uh, what you are actually seeing is a picture. Uh, but what is this? You know, what is physically, what does these uh, pixels mean? Uh, you know, in an MRI machine, uh, generally use, uh, are made to lie down in a uh, magnetic field. You know, if you go to any medical imaging facility, they will say they have 1.5 Tesla MRI machine or three Tesla MRI machine and things like that. So what it means is you are actually lying down in a magnetic field. And uh, what these uh, values actually represent pictorially are actually uh, basically, uh, you know, the magnetization of hydrogen atoms or hydrogen nuclei particularly uh, located at those uh, locations. So here you see there is air and there is nothing, so you'd get a dark image there. Uh, whereas you look at galaxy, then it is a more familiar light-based uh, uh, image, so that uh, you know each pixel here represents the brightness of uh, you know what you're observing, and there is also some color associated with it. I'm sure uh, in the last few lectures you have seen uh, images like this in the Cytex series. But what I want to emphasize here is, you know, just generating these pictures many times uh, while doing science, you just take it for granted that uh, a picture is available to us. But uh, physically, uh, these pictures mean, uh, you know, there is a rich physics involved in uh, actually generating these kind of images. And so uh, how do uh, we form these mental pictures is not such a simple uh, problem. There is a, you know, a diversity of mechanisms. Uh, much more than, uh, you know, just using a single lens. Because a single lens cannot see a virus, it cannot see magnetization and things like that. Uh, telescope is kind of a lens or a mirror, it can see uh, these things, but, you know, uh, the diverse uh, uh, ideas here, uh, meaning they cannot all be seen by cameras or microscopes. Uh, these machines are very complex, uh, something completely different happens in them to generate these images. And so today I want to actually look at these kind of uh, pictures, uh, a few different systems and tell you, you know, where is the physics in it? What is the mathematics involved and uh, what kind of applications are there and what can we do uh, to improve our capabilities uh, in uh, you know, imaging and thereby uh, do uh, new advanced science. Now, uh, let me start, uh, you know, take a step back and uh, kind of start uh, uh, from what you uh, learn in your uh, textbooks. Uh, you know, you're in high school and you must have uh, seen something simple uh, like a lens equation for imaging. And so let's go back to that and just put it uh, in the context of uh, your mobile phone camera. So, you know, you have a, you know, how does your mobile phone actually work? So, or this is the first thing you learn in uh, when you talk of imaging uh, in your school. And so that is this lens equation, uh, which is one over u plus one over v is equal to one over f. What are these quantities? Uh, so if there is a scene, uh, the distance uh, between the scene and the lens, uh, you will call it as u. The distance between lens and the sensor or film, uh, that you will call as v, and f is the focal length of this lens. And so this is a simple equation, uh, but you know there is already something rich I'm showing here. Uh, see, now we are uh, in your mobile phone, there is no film there, but there is an array of pixels uh, which actually uh, uh, records uh, record these images. You know? And you can see that uh, there are uh, 
some colors on these pixels. So uh, these uh, pixels actually have filters on them. So some of them are red, some of them are blue, some of them are green, but you see that there are more greens uh, in that uh, compared to red and blue. The main reason for this is our eye is more sensitive uh, to the green wavelengths. And so uh, more green uh, pic uh, pixels are uh, uh, kept in any color camera. And in any ways, you know, the, uh, the, so the, the place where there is a red pixel, uh, you know, the green information is essentially filled by some sort of advanced interpolation algorithm. But this is essentially there in your camera, uh, you know, in the mobile camera. So you have a lens and a sensor. And if you look at the, you know, if you ever open an old uh, mobile phone, you will see that the camera actually looks like this. This is really tiny. So this is uh, smaller than a, a one rupee coin. Uh, this uh, hole here, it actually contains a small lens. Uh, and uh, just hold. And uh, this uh, this hole is maybe just two or three mm in size. That is the lens size here in your uh, mobile phone. Okay. And uh, what happens when the light actually falls on these pixels? Uh, what happens is uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, there is a photons that go into these pixels. Uh, depending on uh, the filter, certain color or certain band of wavelengths will be absorbed in the pixel. And these uh, pixels are typically semiconducting materials. Uh, and uh, so when you uh, send light onto them, it absorbs. And then uh, these electrons are generated in these pixels. And they are trapped there uh, in uh, what is known as a potential well. And once you take an exposure, uh, many electrons get generated in each of these uh, pixels. And then uh, these electrons are transferred out uh, one by one. And uh, there is an electronic circuit which actually reads out these images. So if you have more electrons in a pixel, that pixel will be brighter. If you have less electrons uh, in the image, uh, that pixel will be, uh, you know, uh, it will be uh, darker. And so uh, when you read it out, uh, and then uh, what happens is uh, it goes through some image processor or all kinds of things. And uh, after that, you actually get the same image of the scene uh, back onto uh, this, uh, basically, your screen. Or this is an image which is, again, in terms of numbers. And these numbers are actually uh, stored in the camera, uh, in the computer when you uh, store the image as a JPEG image or something like that. So when you send the image uh, to your friend, uh, you know, these numbers are sent. And then uh, the, at the other end, you know, this JPEG coding is again uh, decoded. And then uh, the other person can also see the same image. Uh, so that same information is transmitted. Yeah, but uh, so this is a very, very basic uh, imaging equation and things like that. Nothing uh, new, probably. You might have seen uh, this equation. Definitely many of you have seen. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, already you can see that there is a lot of rich physics in actually making all these uh, uh, devices and uh, you know uh, gadgets. You know, so uh, making this uh, silicon pixels, you know, all all these require uh, very advanced uh, concepts uh, in physics, but also precision engineering because you know without that you will not actually be able to put uh, together such systems in a compact form. And then there is also mathematics of uh, image processing. You uh, you know all of you. Probably on your mobile phone, you play with uh, different filters to enhance images. So that is all uh, some mathematics is there, uh, and that is how uh, you know these images are generated. But today I want to uh, you know uh, not go in this direction, not uh, just discuss uh, what you already know, uh, just these additional things, but uh, you know give you a more uh, advanced uh, perspective about uh, what uh, imaging is all about, okay? And so what I want to uh, look at imaging as is uh, basically uh, imaging as a, a phenomenon of uh, information transfer rather than uh, you know, uh, as something as a lens equation or something like that. And so generally in all kinds of imaging systems that I uh, discussed, uh, you know, the three, one, the three imaging systems I already showed, you know, there is already, uh, you know, there is some source of uh, radiation uh, most of the times it is light or electromagnetic waves, but uh, you know the source of radiation could also be sound waves. For example, in the ultrasound kind of uh, imaging, uh, you generate sound waves, uh, but or you can also have electrons uh, in a like in an electron microscope. But uh, typically, all of them we will just call as light waves right now. Uh, they are all uh, waves and they behave uh, in some similar ways. Uh, and so you have some source and uh, there is uh, some incident waves. Uh, that go onto uh, an object that is uh, something that we want to look at. Uh, except for uh, astronomy, where the source itself is uh, of interest, uh, most other systems, uh, the source actually illuminates uh, the object. 
And uh, so these waves that are incident on the object, uh, they actually, uh, you know, they get scattered from the object. And uh, the, uh, these are scattered waves. I have uh, kind of denoted them uh, by function of uh, the space coordinate and also uh, the time coordinate here. And so there is the scattered waves that are always, uh, you know, once you illuminate the object, uh, these scattered waves are uh, coming, uh, you know, getting scattered. And then uh, what we want to look at imaging as, uh, you know, what do, uh, what information do these scattered waves contain? You know, the, so the scattered waves, you can say, uh, encode actually information about the object uh, that is of interest to you here. And this information uh, is in various forms. So you could, uh, you know, the energy or amplitude of the waves can be changing across uh, this uh, scattered waves. You know, the object may be absorbing at some locations. It may be uh, reflecting more at some locations. So the energy or amplitude of these scattered waves will change. There is also a concept of phase. Uh, you know, uh, those who have studied anything uh, with waves on a string, you kind of know uh, that the waves uh, can lead or lag and things like that. So waves that are for example, uh, scattered from this part of the object and uh, from a farther part of the object, those waves will have some kind of phase lag in between them. Okay? And so there is a phase information in that. There's also a spectrum or color information because uh, you know this object is already colorful. You can see the different parts of the object, they're reflecting uh, different uh, colors. And so that information is also there. And there are many more things actually, physics uh, wise, there are many, many more properties uh, in these scattered waves. Uh, there is polarization, coherence, uh, but those things we will not discuss right now. Mainly, what I want uh, you to understand is there is these waves actually contain uh, sort of uh, encode information about this object. Okay? And uh, so, as soon as the light waves interact with this object, uh, this information is actually embedded in the scattered waves. And does, uh, so, what does an imaging system actually do? So, once these uh, encoded waves are there, uh, what your imaging system does is, you know, these waves, you know, your imaging system will have some aperture uh, through which these uh, waves are entering. Okay, and uh, so uh, the goal of your imaging system actually is uh, to decode this information that is present in these encoded waves, and in such a form that uh, you know you can make a picture of what you are looking at. Okay, so this object may be a football, it may be an atom, it may be a star, it may be whatever you are looking at. Uh, but uh, the aim is, you know, uh, take this information, manipulate it in some form and arrange it in a form uh, such that for humans, it will be uh, usefully uh, seen uh, in the form of a picture. And so once uh, you have a picture, then you feel that you understand uh, what is happening there. Okay, so in our understanding of the uh, you know, world, uh, the visual information or image information plays a lot of role. I mean, just look at this ball and uh, if, when you just look at it, you see so many things. Uh, if I ask you to just uh, write down, uh, you know, describe this object uh, as, a, you know, in text, uh, you know, or a, a descriptive manner, it's a really very, very difficult. Uh, the ball is still a simple object. But you go to the virus or go to the brain image that I, you know, the head scan MRI image I showed, it's very, very difficult to just describe it qualitatively. Uh, looking at the picture has a lot of uh, importance in how we understand these uh, objects or phenomena and things like that. Now, uh, you know, what is the simplest decoder? Meaning, uh, you all know that lens forms an image and uh, the simplest decoder uh, somehow is a lens. And uh, actually, we didn't have to find this, uh, you know, uh, meaning we didn't have to invent the lens. Somehow nature already uh, found it long time ago. Okay, so, uh, meaning uh, humans and animals all had eyes much before, you know, uh, we could start thinking about science. So this was somehow found, uh, in fact, right now also, uh, you are looking at your screen and, uh, you know, uh, why are you able to read uh, what is there on the screen? Because, you know, your eyes learn to focus uh, very early on when you are babies. And uh, so suppose you imagine that you focus on the wrong plane. So think of an imaginary plane uh, that is between your screen and your eyes. And uh, suppose you uh, learn to focus on that plane. You know, everything will be just a blur. You will not uh, make any sense. But, uh, you know, we uh, this is somehow an ability that uh, uh, infants develop within first few months, actually. And so this is really exciting uh, that how the vision develops, that itself is a very exciting topic. But uh, traditionally, you know, for a long time, and even now, uh, even many uh, digital systems, uh, they have all uh, basically uh, used lens as a basic hardware to form image. So you may have a mobile camera here, uh, you may have a digital pathology kind of setup where, you know, uh, you have a slide of tissue or cells, uh, 
and the doctor instead of looking at it through uh, visually the, the doctor may actually look at it but uh, they can also take a picture of this uh, the cell samples and then uh, you know uh, these uh, images can then be stored rather than uh, just stay in the mind of the doctor you can think about self driving cars uh, you know they also uh, depend on uh, taking pictures uh, with cameras uh, but you know these are all uh, what i would call as traditional imaging systems they all uh, basically use a lens as an element to form image and so uh, what i want to emphasize here is that the basic hardware which is you know hundreds of years old uh, basic ideas of imaging uh, they actually provide you an image already okay in uh, all these systems and then you actually, uh, once you have these images available, see when these images used to be available on a film, uh, then you couldn't do much with them. But uh, now that these are available as numbers uh, from the camera uh, sensor, uh, you can do something with that. So you can write algorithms to uh, make the pictures look better or maybe make some decisions out of it. So for example, these pictures, uh, you know, you could identify uh, the disease cells uh, by uh, algorithmically from this picture or, you know, for a self-driving car, for example, uh, you know, uh, some decisions might be taken automated way, you know, where the boundary of the road is and things like that. So these kind of things where, you know, traditional hardware is already available uh, to make a basic image, uh, that uh, area is uh, known as image processing. So you can take the picture directly uh, and then enhance the look of the image or derive some information from these images. And that is already a very well-developed uh, mature field where uh, you are actually uh, doing just image processing where you assume that uh, image is already given to you and nothing uh, new is to be done there and all uh, the new things uh, that are happening are on the algorithm side or machine learning side and things like that so uh, physics wise there is nothing new here all these things are uh, just uh, you know uh, more and more complex lenses uh, but uh, you know nothing more than that uh, but uh, what I want to emphasize today are new kinds of systems uh, that are imaging systems uh, that go beyond this. You know, so uh, nature already taught us that uh, a lens actually does uh, basically imaging. But today, when we talk about imaging, uh, we want to go beyond this uh, traditional imaging model that uh, just uses a lens. And so already we have kind of gone beyond that in last uh, few decades. And today, uh, the most uh, important imaging systems that allow you to do research, explore nature on a new scale, they are not just about uh, having a lens and uh, making a, a picture. Okay, So these are very interesting systems. Uh, we will discuss some of them today, uh, but uh, you know, let me just go over some of them. So the, here is an interesting uh, picture of a system that is called as Phrenoptic Camera. What this camera allows you to do is you know, uh, basically uh, focus the image after it has been captured. So generally, when you take a picture with your normal camera, you have to focus on the object of interest. But in Opti camera, you don't have to worry about focusing. You just uh, take a picture randomly, and then uh, once the data is there, you can focus anywhere you want. Uh, here is a cryo-electron microscope. You know, uh, you know uh, right now this pandemic is there, and you saw this uh, pictures of COVID with uh, you know spikes on them and all that. That kind of pictures are generated in a cryo-electron microscope. Cryo here stands for, you know, uh, you have to freeze this sample. Otherwise, these viruses, if they are in liquid, uh, they are going to keep uh, moving like a Brownian particles, and uh, you cannot really match them. So uh, you freeze them, and then uh, you pass an electron beam through them, and then uh, you actually create images. But those images are not directly usable. You have to actually apply uh, very advanced algorithms, collect a lot of data, and then form those uh, 3D uh, models of images. Sometimes, it can take months to actually make uh, the, pic uh, the picture, the 3D model of the virus. There are many interesting systems where, uh, you know, lensless or coherent diffraction imaging uh, kind of systems where, you know, you use uh, coherent X-rays and things like that, where wavelengths where you cannot really make lenses, but you can still scatter light. And so they have nanostructures or molecular uh, structures, or, you know, uh, you can just shine uh, a pulsed uh, X-ray laser on them and just get a scattering pattern. Now, uh, this data is not uh, sufficient to form an image, but what we are kind of doing is that, uh, you know, there is no lens here, just free space itself acts like an optics. And uh, there are many challenging problems in this area where this kind of data you take and then uh, form an image computationally uh, with this kind of data, okay? 
Uh, there is another area which is very important uh, today is uh, what is known as super resolution. For uh, 300 years, you know, uh, you know, you we have learned that uh, we cannot use light to image something smaller than wavelength, but uh, that is no longer true. Uh, we can beat the diffraction limit. We can see uh, structures in cells that are of the order of 100 nanometers by using visible light, which is uh, you know has a wavelength that is fivefold actually. There are MRI CT type of machines. Uh, you see these in pictures or you have, may have seen uh, them at a hospital, uh, but uh, the point is uh, these are uh, very interesting devices. They actually don't uh, produce direct pictures. They uh, just produce some numbers. And then uh, what you don't see in this picture is uh, like an advanced uh, server behind uh, in a uh, different room, which does a lot of uh, uh, you know sophisticated kind of mathematical problem uh, to make that image. And you know this is very uh, interesting because you generate some numbers, and those pictures are actually looked at by doctors uh, to diagnose a person. So it's somebody's uh, life and death kind of matter. Uh, but uh, we have developed uh, some kind of confidence now that these images are uh, meaningful uh, and represent something uh, of the internal organs. But having these machines, you know, 50 years ago, uh, you know, uh, some development in these areas started. Today, these machines are there, and you can image internal organs of a human uh, without, you know, cutting them open. And so that has saved, uh, you know, a lot of uh, costs and uh, pain for, uh, you know, uh, at the operation theater. Uh, three years ago, you may have seen uh, this image of a black hole uh, at the center of M87 galaxy. Uh, that is also uh, something very interesting that the, uh, I will talk a little bit more about this system later, but uh, essentially uh, you're trying to make an earth sized, uh, uh, you know, telescope by you know, putting antennas at different corners of the. Earth. And uh, so this is, uh, these are the kind of uh, systems where raw images or, you know, there is no raw image as such. It's just a raw data or numbers uh, that are not visually recognizable as image at all. And uh, what uh, happens is uh, there are algorithms. Uh, reconstruction algorithms that uh, understand uh, the physics of uh, you know what uh, you know how this data is collected and this uh, coding then is inverted by uh, mathematically and the image that is formed is uh, then is this meaningful to humans okay so uh, meaning all these uh, new systems which are exciting today uh, you know how things are going uh, it is more and more computational kind of imaging systems where hardware are actually used to collect some raw numbers and then uh, generate images out of so this is really an interesting area, and why should uh, this kind of thing work in the first place? So let us look at it uh, once again. Our uh, earlier example, you have scattered waves from this object, and maybe this is a traditional camera, and it has a lens. And then there is a uh, imaging system, which has a sensor and things like that. But imagine this, that uh, suppose I just remove this lens. Okay? So what I do is, uh, you know, uh, I already told you that uh, these scattered waves encode all the information. And uh, you know uh, I have put lens as a decoder, but let's suppose I remove this lens, uh, and this aperture is still there. And so even if I remove the lens, that same information is still actually uh, getting into the system. And so uh, it's not in a form that is uh, visually recognizable, but that's fine. Uh, you know, as as long as uh, we can write an algorithm, uh, then uh, and include that as a part of the system, uh, then uh, you know uh, you don't really need a lens for uh, doing image. Okay, so you can collect some numbers, uh, do a reconstruction uh, of image based on the data, and then uh, at the end, you know, for the user, you just need uh, to present an image that is uh, visually meaningful. Okay? So uh, from the information perspective, whether you put a lens there or don't put a lens there, the information is still going into your hardware. So how you handle it is up to uh, you. Okay? And why should we kind of go to this model? Uh, we have to kind of ask ourselves, why are we not happy with our lens uh, as it is previously? And what is it that uh, this algorithm is kind of adding? Or is it just our fancy that we want to do uh, this kind of thing? It's just like uh, we like to play with that. But it's not like that. Okay, so uh, why should you do uh, this route? Why should you uh, combine hardware and algorithms? There are two main reasons. So I will, uh, you know, these are uh, very important points uh, of this lecture. Uh, and uh, what I want you to kind of understand by the end of it is, you know, uh, I want you to convince, uh, be convinced that uh, this is true. Okay, so first uh, is that, you know, by combining this hardware and algorithms, uh, we can actually start thinking of beating uh, the fundamental limits on imaging devices. So these are fundamental physics limits kind of that have existed for hundreds of years. Uh, that you know, uh, if you combine them, uh, maybe we can start uh, thinking about beating them. 
And so uh, this beating these limits actually allows us to see objects on new space time scales. So you know, today I cannot resolve uh, an object and tomorrow I can suddenly resolve it. And so I can see the same object at a different scale. And then uh, that can lead to uh, really new science. And uh, this is where you know science advances that you observe something new on a scale that you have not seen before. Uh, and then uh, it allows you to advance your understanding or uh, of the nature or objects around. You. But uh, this is not the only thing. Uh, there is also second important point that if we combine hardware and algorithms, uh, what you can do is you can make uh, these systems economical in some sense. So many uh, technologies like MRI, for example, they are very expensive. So if you can do something uh, that uh, you know uh, by combining hardware in some ways and uh, the algorithms. Uh, you can make uh, uh, these uh, high-end technologies, uh, you know, they can be made cheaper and therefore uh, they can be made accessible to a wider population. And so there is a social impact uh, that uh, these uh, ideas can make. And so, you know, I don't want to just uh, give you these uh, as a lecture, but uh, I would like to uh, show you these as uh, through some concrete examples in today's uh, lecture. Uh, so first, I will just show you some examples uh, of uh, various things that are happening around the world, and then also some of the things uh, towards end. I will also show you some new concepts that have been developed in my own lab uh, at IIT. So first of all, uh, you know, let us look at uh, you know just uh, you know still uh, go back to the lens kind of systems. Uh, so it, maybe I have made it sound as if there is nothing uh, new to be done there, uh, but let us look at a couple of systems that are still uh, lens based. Uh, that is, uh, so first uh, let us look at the focusing problem one uh, that, uh, you know, you have probably seen a microscope uh, in your school or somewhere. And uh, what you do is uh, you pick, uh, you put some sample there and then you view uh, the image from the top uh, through the view, uh, view finder. And uh, what you actually need to do generally to see this picture is, uh, you know, uh, this uh, knob is there. So you have to actually focus the cell. Uh, whatever you're seeing, you need to focus. If you don't focus, uh, you'll see a blurred image. And particularly if you have thick objects. So I'm going to show you a small video uh, where, uh, you know, uh, it's an image of see on uh, food that is left out, for example. Uh, the fungus is actually quite thick. And so uh, at a time, uh, a microscope like this can focus, uh, you know, just a few microns at the most. But since the fungus is maybe 100 microns in thick, thickness, uh, you see that as you scan through this, uh, you actually see that, uh, you know, different parts of this fungus are actually coming into focus. And what do you do with this? Because, you know, you may have uh, seen in your uh, mobile uh, apps that you can take a blurred picture and then you can uh, make it, you know, sharper and things like that. So you might think that, well, can I take this picture and make it sharper? Uh, but it's a little bit difficult problem because you see that, uh, you know, at different locations in the image, you have different depths. Uh, you don't know beforehand where uh, which object is at what depth, and then the blurring actually is actually uh, depth dependent. So things that are closer uh, to the focus plane, they are a little bit sharp. Things that are farther from the focus plane, they are uh, blurred differently. So uh, if you just apply your uh, you know uh, image sharpening kind of filter, uh, like uh, what you do on your phone, uh, you know it will not work. But uh, what can we do? Uh, can we do something else? Uh, and so I'm not going to get into details, but let us say that uh, you know we add some coded mask uh, here uh, at the back uh, uh, point of this lens. And uh, what you can do is uh, make this mask uh, design it uh, optically such that uh, basically what this mask does is uh, you know it makes a picture where you know there is still uh, still a blurred picture, uh, but the blur is somehow made uh, depth independent. So uh, you know this object which is here in the normal imaging, what is happening is the object that is closer to the uh, focus plane that is appears for appearing uh, focused more, the object that is farther is appearing more blurred. Uh, but what if we do something where, you know, all objects are kind of are blurred by the same way. And so you can uh, make this picture by uh, doing something smart. Okay, so here all the depths, uh, they have been actually uh, blurred by same amount. Uh, independent of where they are located. So this kind of design of this mask is very key. It involves uh, a deep understanding of optics and also uh, mathematical modeling of this whole process. Uh, but it is possible to do something like this. But now that you know uh, everything is uh, you know blurred uh, by the same amount, independent of the depth, uh, you can now apply your blur filter or deep blur filter, and you can get that. You know, so you can see that uh, over the whole depth, uh, you know, uh, the image now appears uh, to be sharp. But let me tell you that there is no single lens that can actually achieve this. 
what you see here is a picture uh, where everything is in focus, uh, but uh, there is no lens ex uh, that exists that can do this imaging directly. Uh, meaning if you can uh, do that, you will be violating some uh, basic principles of classical optics. But you know, uh, these principles were made 100, 150 years ago when algorithms were not there. So today, uh, when you relook at these things, uh, this kind of performance is actually possible. This particular picture is actually uh, out of some simple experiment we did in my own lab. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is really uh, interesting that uh, things that are over a very large depth can be made to, uh, can be brought into focus in a single image. And, you know, you think about applications like a self-driving car where, you know, uh, you want, uh, you know, the you know sharpness actually decides, uh, you know, where the objects are located. And so if uh, your camera is somewhat depth independent, and it focuses everywhere, uh, then this can be very important. This is also very important as you see here in microscopy uh, where you are observing uh, thick samples. Let us look at another uh, system, uh, which is also equally interesting. Uh, this is uh, uh, what we will call as planoptic camera that I already uh, explained. Planoptic means uh, it is, uh, you know, it's kind of recording everything, okay, uh, in terms of focus again. So uh, how does a traditional camera look? For example, if you look at a traditional camera, uh, you have a lens and a sensor. Uh, the sensor could be filmed in the old times. Today, it's a digital camera, so it's electronic sensor. But you know, going from film to this uh, new type of cameras, uh, the physics has not really changed so much. And the physics is still same. The lens is forming an image on that. You know, in old times when things were on film, you could not just quickly take a picture and send it to your friend on some uh, media app. But today that is possible. But you know, uh, physics-wise, that has not uh, nothing has changed in here. But let us think of another model where you still have the lens and sensor, and you add some optics in between. Okay? And uh, what you do is by doing this, you record something on the sensor that is not visually meaningful, and so it needs a computer uh, to process and then uh, display. And so additional optics and uh, computer algorithm uh, make the system a little more complex. Uh, but you know, uh, why should we do this? Meaning, uh, if we, uh, the, it makes sense to do this only if uh, you know you can achieve uh, something that is not possible with this kind of system. Okay? And so, what is possible with this kind of camera? Uh, let us uh, look at that. So uh, you know, uh, anybody who has taken a picture uh, knows that you have to focus your lens. So if you have a far object or a close object. You need to focus your lens twice, and uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, the far object cannot be focused, uh, and this object cannot be focused, uh, you know, uh, at different times. Uh, meaning, uh, traditionally, you would uh, take two pictures, but uh, can we do this uh, with a single camera exposure? You know, so that is a very interesting question. Uh, and this kind of camera is already now a commercial system. Uh, so you can look up uh, this litro.com. Uh, this camera came up about uh, 10, 50, 10 years or so ago. Now, what does it do? Uh, this camera is, uh, you know, instead of uh, having just a lens and, uh, you know, image sensor, it actually introduces uh, a, a lot of tiny lenses in between. Okay, so it's an array of lenses, and uh, these lenses are placed in a peculiar location here. And so, what you record on the uh, camera sensor uh, looks something like this. There is some scene here that you are trying to image, but generally you will form an image here. But uh, because of this lens array in between. Uh, the image now uh, looks like many, many sub images. And, uh, you know, uh, so there is one additional hardware here, which uh, we call as micro lens array. But what this kind of image uh, recording allows you is to do uh, uh, focusing after the image has been recorded. So I already mentioned this uh, uh, idea uh, in the early part of the talk. And uh, so what it does is, you know, uh, basically uh, when you uh, have a traditional camera, uh, you actually uh, you know, just uh, sum up all the energy that is coming to a pixel. But this type of recording, what it allows you to do is uh, tra keep track of, you know, also the distribution of light energy coming from uh, different angles. How that is so, I will not be able to explain today, but, uh, you know, at least I just want to give you an idea that what additional information is here. And if this additional information is there, then you can use this information to actually do something like this, uh, which is really interesting because, uh, you know, you can uh, bring, so after the image has been recorded, you can bring the spider in focus or the leaves in focus, uh, you know, so it is post-processing. Really here, you know, the near object and far object, and uh, you know, that is also brought in focus, uh, but after the image has been captured. Uh, 
So again, I want to say that uh, it is not possible to do with a sim single lens. It is also not possible to do with just an image processing algorithm alone, uh, but the unconventional hardware and reconstruction algorithm uh, together actually make this possible. So these ideas uh, of focus problem one and focus problem two actually violate some uh, principles that are uh, you know uh, uh, about 150 years old in optics. Uh, but you know, uh, as uh, as I said earlier, uh, again, I want to uh, emphasize it that uh, once you combine uh, the hardware and the algorithms, uh, then uh, the performance can be very different. And so these are uh, examples from uh, simple photography or microscopy, but uh, you know, uh, some profound principles are actually getting violated here. Now let us look at another uh, kind of application uh, where uh, you know you want to actually uh, see uh, you know the fundamental limit of uh, resolution, uh, what is called as the uh, diffraction limit. But uh, can you uh, beat? So uh, in a microscope, the first uh, element is actually a lens, and uh, if you take a sample and then illuminate it with some light with wavelength lambda. You see that uh, you know there is some small angle scattering and there is a large angle scattering. Okay, and so typically, you know things uh, the features that are large they make a, a small angle scattering. Features that are small in the sample they make a, a large angle scattering. <coughs> and why I have shown them with different colors is that uh, the small angle scattering is actually entering the lens, and these uh, rays are actually not entering the lens, so they are not going to contribute to image formation. And so the limit uh, because of these uh, rays that are just entering the lens, uh, that is known as the diffraction limit. And uh, so the, this is the scattered light corresponding to features that are smaller than this diffraction. And so for 350 years since uh, the microscopes uh, were invented, this limit has existed on uh, you know, observation, uh, the resolution uh, of the images. And the resolution here, is typically given by lambda, which is the wavelength divided by uh, two times uh, the numeric numerical aperture of the lens. This numerical aperture is actually always written here on the uh, lens of a microscope. And so, uh, what does this mean? Uh, so, if lambda is about 600 nanometers and two times Na is just about 1.2 or something, so what it means is, you know, if there are two points here or two uh, or a feature that is smaller than wavelength. Uh, or much smaller than wavelength, typically you cannot see that in a typical microscope. Okay, so this limit has actually uh, uh, existed for a long time, uh, but now let us look at it in a different way. Can you do something a little bit different? Uh, that uh, you know, you just uh, illuminate this same sample uh, with a tilted uh, uh, beam that is coming from uh, be uh, below here on the sample. Now you see that you know the direct scattering or you know small angle scattering uh, that is now not going into the lens and this large angle scattering which was uh, already uh, it was escaping before is now entering this lens and making an image and so if you look at these rays conventionally you may form an image something like this uh, if you look at the tilted rays uh, you know you may find uh, that the image recorded is something like this uh, so you know traditionally uh, you could do nothing you know you have one image this way one image this way but with an algorithm what you can do is uh, you can combine many such images and uh, you know illuminate at different angles and then actually uh, here is a reconstructed picture you can see these fine features uh, now that uh, all these images have been combined in some smart way uh, you can actually see uh, really fine details on this uh, penguin okay so uh, this is something uh, that is possible again only with uh, uh, you know a slight change in the recording process and then uh, you know an algorithm uh, put together but i'm not talking here just uh, in thin air actually there is a uh, you know this idea is called a structured illumination and uh, so this kind of uh, smart illumination and uh, algorithm uh, this actually has led to many practical microscopes like this uh, that actually allow you to beat uh, the traditional uh, limit of resolution and uh, so here is a picture of uh, you know a cell uh, you know where uh, you know the resolution is about 400 nanometers uh, but here uh, the same kind of uh, picture uh, that is generated out of many many uh, shots at uh, different angles and you see that you can go uh, 150 nanometer resolution very easily although uh, it is now uh, much smaller than uh, the wavelength lambda uh, but uh, you know this is possible practically uh, I mean, there are devices like that now uh, this equipment looks very fancy because you know you want to do something at this kind of uh, resolution. Uh, you need to have uh, real uh, vibration isolation and 
you know the the process of recording doing uh, you know the reconstruction all this is not very very simple uh, but still it is possible uh, practically to uh, go down to the this resolution what you see inside these cells are uh, sort of a scaffolding inside the cells uh, that hold the nucleus together and things like that i will not go into that detail uh, but uh, I just want you to notice the change in the resolution from uh, traditional microscope to this kind of new microscope, uh, which is known as the structured illumination microscope. Uh, now, let me ask another question. That is, uh, you know, can you make a telescope which is very large? You know, uh, why should you make a telescope large? Because you can see a better, uh, finer angular, angular resolution. And uh, so if you ask me how big can you make a telescope, maybe I can make, uh, you know, the largest telescope we are thinking right now, uh, you know, on Earth is like this 30 meter telescope or things like that. But, you know, Earth size telescope is much, much bigger than that. And so it's almost uh, impossible to think of making a mirror that is as big as that. But uh, in some sense, uh, you know, the Event Horizon Telescope actually achieved exactly that. So uh, what is done here is, uh, you know, there are these uh, radio antennas that are placed at different uh, places on Earth. And then, uh, you know, uh, you collect signals at each antennas. If you kind of look at what is the uh, signals that are recorded by these antennas, uh, it is really surprising. Uh, you might find it really unusual, but the signals recorded at these antennas may just look like this. You know, this is just some random uh, looking pattern. Uh, there is really no information there in these patterns. Uh, you know, these signals at individual antennas, if you just record, uh, there is, you know, just a time domain pattern. Uh, the current in the antenna is just fluctuate. And you might think that, you know, what, what kind of image am I going to generate out of this? <coughs> Thing is, uh, the information now is there in the correlation of these signals. What do I mean by correlation? You take this signal and you multiply by this signal, uh, you know, point by point, and then take an average over time. Now, uh, generally, if things are completely random, not correlated with each other, such product and sum averaging uh, will just lead to zero. But you know, in, when these antennas actually take these signals and then actually uh, do correlations, you find that there are uh, you know some meaningful correlation actually exists in signals in these antennas. Although each signal may look completely random, there is some relation between this signal and this signal, this signal and this signal, and so on. And so what you do is actually uh, you know this information is actually uh, you know, in the correlation is generated, and uh, then uh, you know uh, there is a mathematical problem solved. Uh, to form this image. You know, so this center of M87 galaxy that uh, had a black hole in the center, uh, you know, that uh, from our uh, location, you know, from Earth, we are actually looking at something which is 55 million light years away. And that's a huge distance. You know, really nothing can be seen uh, with an ordinary telescope uh, with this kind of resolution. Uh, but now by creating antennas at different locations like this, you have actually uh, created effectively uh, synthetically you have created a telescope which is almost of the size of the earth you know so uh, these kind of concepts which are uh, technologically somehow impossible uh, they can be actually uh, realized in practice and they are happening uh, at the uh, forefront of science today now i want to change the gears a little bit and uh, basically uh, you know these are some interesting systems i talked to you about and so i want to bring some level of uh, mathematics uh, at the level of uh, you know what you can understand and so uh, let us ask uh, this simple question first uh, that you know uh, you are familiar with uh, you know let's go back to your mobile phone and the camera and uh, let us understand how much data is actually exchanged uh, when you share uh, pictures and so today if you take a digital camera uh, it is easily uh, 10 megapixels you know, if you had one megapixel today people will say uh, i don't like that phone uh, but uh, you know so uh, let's think about 10 megapixel camera which means there are 10 million pixels and each one uh, is going to have three colors associated with it red green and blue and so if you just calculate it 3 into 10 into 10 so 6 uh, you know these many number of uh, you know numbers that are say represented by 8 bit now you have 30 mb of data but you know when you send a picture to your friend uh, is the data that much uh, no meaning if that data is that much i'm sure your parents will be very unhappy with the data bill uh, but uh, you know how is this possible why is this possible that uh, you know the images that you share uh, with your friends they are just a few hundred kb probably uh, although if you think just in terms of numbers uh, that is uh, that much of data <laughs> And so, uh, you know, the idea is that, uh, you know, when a picture has some uh, meaningful structure to it, uh, you know, the number of numbers required to store it is actually much less than the number of pixels. And uh, so this uh, idea, 
I'm going to explain uh, with a picture in the next slide uh, that uh, you know it, this you may not understand it right now, but let's uh, look at it uh, this way. So you have uh, this picture of IIT Delhi building, and you see that uh, there are maybe M pixels visually arranged here on the screen. But you look at this uh, structure, you know. So in the sky, things are really flat. Uh, you know, there are some edges, but you know this part of the building uh, is looking like flat. You know, and uh, so there is locally some structure is there. This image is not just random noise. And so uh, the idea is, uh, you know, the question uh, you can. Is, so basically, the idea is number of uh, numbers needed to uh, represent this picture is probably going to be much less than that. Okay, and uh, that is why all these applications like you know MP3 music or you know JPEG uh, images on your phone, all these exist because of this uh, possibility that many signals that are realistic they can be represented uh, in terms of numbers that are much less than the pixels. And so uh, this kind of raises an important question that you know if you are trying to image something meaningful and that has a number of uh, numbers that require to uh, represent that is uh, implicitly somehow much less than M. And the question arises as, you know, uh, if uh, the information is somehow less in that compared to number of pixels, then can we generate the same picture by uh, probably less measurements? Okay, and so this problem is analogous to, you know, solving uh, a system of equations uh, that you may be familiar with. So suppose uh, you are given these systems uh, like this. So A11, A12, these are numbers. B1, B2, B3 are numbers, and X1, X2, X3 are variables. And so, uh, probably you are, if you are in class nine or ten, uh, you are probably already uh, solved this kind of system. You know, so I believe that uh, you know how to uh, solve this. You know, eliminate these things and you know uh, convert. You know, if you have three equations like that that are independent, uh, then you can actually find the values of x one, x two, x three. Now we are dealing with systems that are very large. So think about uh, you know uh, number of variables as x one, x two, x three up to x n. Uh, as unknowns that are needed to represent the image. And uh, let's suppose B1, B2, B3 is like the data that the imaging hardware is generating. Okay, so what is measured in the imaging system is B1, B2, B3, and so, so on. And X1, X2, X3, these are the unknowns that you want to uh, find out uh, if you have, uh, you know, you want to generate the image. And typically, you know, we are here, I'm showing you just a, a three by three kind of system, but here uh, the N that I'm talking about uh, when we talk about typical pictures today, the n is in millions or ten to six or something like that. So it's a huge system of equations. You can't just write it down like that. Uh, only computers can actually solve that kind of system. But not, uh, you know, uh, to solve that, you don't need, uh, you know, uh, big uh, frames, uh, mainframe kind of computers or big uh, servers. But uh, you know, uh, today uh, we are able to solve this kind of systems even on a simple laptop or even your Android device to some extent. So uh, the question is, you know, you can ask is uh, if you want to solve for these unknowns, uh, how many equations are needed or how many measurements you have to do uh, to make an n pixel image where n is in millions? And so the traditional answer, if you ask me, is, uh, you know, n, uh, because, you know, if you are n uh, unknowns, then you will need n equations uh, to solve this kind of system. Suppose now, uh, you know, uh, we are in a situation where, uh, the, uh, you know, we have n unknowns, but the number of equations are uh, really less, okay? So much less than that. Maybe only 10% or 20% equations are available to us. All the equations, you know, all the data cannot be measured because of, uh, you know, whatever limits are there. Maybe technological limits or cost limits or whatever it is. Uh, but we also know, for example, that, uh, you know, the many unknowns are uh, very close to zero. So this is like this, that, you know, although there were M pixels, the number of numbers needed to store uh, this image was less than uh, much less than n. So uh, we are trying to solve a system like this, where uh, we have this uh, matrix of uh, these numbers like a11, a12, and these are the unknowns x1, x2. But you know that many of them are uh, zeros. You don't know which ones are zeros, uh, but you know that many of them are zeros. That's all. And then these are the measurements that the imaging system performs: b1, b2, like that. And so we are trying to solve this kind of system where a uh, number of equations is less uh, and in such a way that, you know, the image solution somehow makes sense. Okay, And so it's not trivial to solve this. Uh, actually, uh, basically, it requires interesting algorithms that are fairly advanced. Uh, but today, you know, this kind of uh, system of equations can be solved if you have, uh, you know, if you have less equations than number of unknowns. And if you know that uh, or if you expect that the solution is such that many of these unknowns are probably zero, then you can actually solve, uh, you can write interesting algorithms uh, that will solve this kind of system. 
Now, you know, this is really at an elementary level uh, that you are just talking about linear equations, uh, but many uh, imaging systems can be to some extent modeled uh, in this way. And the point is, if you can solve this kind of system of equations, uh, what is the implication of them? You know, if you solve such things, uh, what actually happens? Uh, what is the big deal? In fact, uh, the example I showed you just now, uh, Event Horizon Telescope, uh, it actually the information that it measures is only 10 to 15 percent of the number of pixels in the final image. Okay, so this is really, uh, you know, the example that we just discussed already uh, behaves as per that. Okay, so uh, not all equations are available. We cannot make hundreds of these uh, telescopes uh, everywhere. Uh, it's only six of them are actually doing this. And, uh, you know, but uh, you can solve this problem mathematically in a meaningful way and actually get this picture. So, the, you know, it's a kind of hardware and algorithm are both important. If you have no hardware, no data can be collected. Uh, and if you just have hardware, you know, data is uh, completely meaningless uh, to you visually. So algorithm is also required. So together uh, they can make this kind of system possible. Uh, but the point is, you know, uh, only after people knew that you know this kind of problem can be solved, uh, then in the first place people started thinking about making such systems. So you know the systems are uh, made possible because uh, you know a mathematical problem of this type, uh, which sounds elementary but very interesting, can actually be solved in a meaningful way. Let us come close to uh, Earth. I Meaning, this is really a big example. You are looking at something very, very far away. But similar ideas can also apply to, uh, you know, uh, things like MRI. For example, this is a blood uh, flow imaging through MRI machine. Uh, it it has been generated. This image has been generated with full data. So if there are n pixels here, n measurements have been done. Uh, if you have uh, one fourth of data, uh, then you know traditionally, if you think about it. Uh, you try to solve it in some ways, but uh, you know uh, it gives a very poor quality image. So less data is not acceptable because the doctor will not like this image. You know many of these details are actually missing now. Okay, uh, whereas uh, if you try to solve these uh, problems in a new way, uh, newer algorithms uh, that have been developed in last 10, 20 years, uh, then you can actually uh, solve this problem in an effective way with real data, and uh, you can actually get something uh, which is really not distinguishable from uh, you know the full data kind of uh, traditional algorithm reconstruction now this is not uh, some simulation this is a image of a, a, a real person's uh, uh, brain okay so uh, the blood flow in a real person's brain so these things are not uh, just in theory they are actually uh, in practice but just imagine uh, what is the implication of this that if you uh, have to measure less data uh, it means that your system can be made uh, much more cheaper okay so and the other thing is you know cheaper doesn't mean that you have to make it uh, uh, cheap okay so uh, meaning the performance should not be cheap or worse performance should be similar okay and so but uh, putting together the hardware and algorithm together uh, you know it cost uh, overall uh, much less okay so these machines like MRI, for example, cost uh, anywhere between one to two million US dollars. And so these are not uh, simple technologies and not really uh, affordable technologies in many places. But you know, if you can do something like this, the mathematics actually enables you to make these systems cheaper. And then uh, the implication is that you know uh, these advanced technologies can be uh, made affordable and accessible to a larger population. Okay, so this is uh, really other aspect of the game that uh, in one case, what we saw is because of these ideas, you know, such big giant systems like EHT are made possible. But on the other hand, at a hospital level, you know, uh, a technology like that, which is considered expensive, can be made accessible to a much larger uh, number of people because the cost of putting together the system is uh, very uh, has been reduced. Okay, so uh, the both uh, sides of the coin are very important uh, because uh, the main idea is uh, you create some impact. Okay, what is another uh, kind of uh, example is now uh, I'm coming towards end of my talk. So uh, this is something, uh, another recent work uh, from my laboratory. Uh, we were looking at some uh, very simple problem uh, like this, and uh, it ended up uh, become, uh, meaning uh, this basic question ended up becoming a very interesting microscope in itself. So uh, let's suppose you have a laser pointer and you send it on a, a camera like this, and then uh, you have a glass plate and you send the same laser pointer through uh, the camera and onto the camera. Now, uh, the question you can ask is, you know, uh, you know, in these two cases, uh, does the light actually know that uh, it has now passed through glass and uh, or here it has passed through just air? Uh, the point is, uh, you know, if you just look at the camera, uh, you may see that the image is uh, almost same because, you know, uh, the glass is transparent. Maybe it reflects some light back, but otherwise 
uh, the image that is formed in the camera on the two cases is essentially same. Now, uh, the point is, you know that uh, you know, if, uh, the light has gone through glass here, so it has probably uh, slowed down a little bit. And uh, the question is, can you actually measure this information? So when uh, the light slows down, uh, this information is actually imprinted uh, on the light waves in the form of uh, what is known as the phase of the light waves. Okay, and so the question is, can you measure this phase uh, by doing something uh, in a accurately with some in instrument? So if you can tell uh, how much this light has slowed or measure how much change of phase has happened, uh, then you can start answering this kind of question. These are curious questions, but they are uh, really profound when you start thinking about them uh, from a physics or algorithmic point of view. <laughs> And uh, what you can do is, uh, you know, uh, you can also have some cells uh, sitting on this, uh, uh, you know, glass plate. So, uh, you know, this light goes through the cells. It has uh, slowed down a little bit. And then uh, what is known as a, a idea of interference is that, uh, you know, you can take the same laser beam and split it into. And then uh, this beam actually goes through the cells and this beam does not go through the cells. And so when these two uh, fall on the camera now, uh, you record something like this. Okay, So wherever the cells were there, uh, you know, uh, so uh, when the cells are not there, you see that uh, there are uh, what is known as interference fringes that are formed. Uh, these are straight line uh, fringes, uh, but wherever there is a cell, uh, you see that these fringes actually bend a little bit, and that actually contains information about this phase or uh, delay of light uh, that is actually uh, present here. Now, it is only about eight or nine years ago that uh, we found that, that uh, you know, a, a very new idea or a new result uh, that high resolution phase information like this can be uh, recovered uh, with a new algorithm, uh, which requires uh, very much less data. So traditionally, uh, if you require, uh, you know, n number of uh, data points to get this information to full resolution, uh, what our algorithm did was uh, it requires only 20% uh, or 25% data, and still you get uh, this full information. And so if you can solve such a problem, uh, you know, in a, a new, this this problem sounds elementary, but if you can make such a contribution, uh, then uh, you know you have uh, new information accessible with much less data, and then uh, you can actually create a new instrument. So, in fact, uh, this mathematics of uh, incomplete data kind of uh, problem solution can lead to new imaging instruments for advanced research. And so, we have actually uh, developed a new. Uh, 3D imaging kind of microscope. This is an advanced research instrument which is sitting in uh, the central facility, shared uh, advanced instrumentation facility of IIT Delhi. So any researcher now across the country, uh, you know, they want to uh, test uh, their cells or anything else, uh, you know, they can actually image with the samples uh, in this kind of uh, uh, instrument. But this instrument is actually enabled by the algorithm. Uh, the engineering uh, required to actually uh, put together this instrument is also important. It is not uh, that it is not important, uh, but uh, you know, uh, again, meaning what I want to say is, uh, you know, the instrument and the algorithm go together, and you give uh, get a performance that is uh, unprecedented uh, that nobody can achieve uh, before uh, with simple, uh, you know, simple hardware or simple uh, algorithm. Now, what does this uh, microscope actually do? Uh, you know, if you have uh, blood cells, for example, which are not stained, uh, they might look some something like this in a traditional microscope. So the, here is a, a cell of a healthy athletic person, typical cell. Uh, this is a cell from uh, a smoker, a chain smoker individual, and this is a, a cell from a malaria infected person. These are uh, typical cells, uh, you know, that show some signatures. Uh, but the point is, if you just do a normal microscopy. Uh, what you see is there are some changes, but you know uh, nominally all the images look similar. They all look like donuts. Uh, not much uh, difference in them. But if you look at this microscope, you know uh, through this microscope, what you actually see is uh, there is a stunning difference when you uh, create a three D image of the cell. Okay, so. Uh, uh, here, uh, you know, the uh, green to red is actually kind of a height map of the cell, and this uh, this is not observed uh, through this viewfinder. Uh, if you look through the viewfinder, you may actually see something like this, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, this kind of uh, 3D is generated algorithmically. So hardware and algorithm together uh, can make you... Uh, provide you information uh, that is not available uh, with a traditional microscopy. So again, I want to emphasize that uh, doing this uh, hardware and algorithm together is meaningful only if uh, you can beat uh, what is available uh, to most users otherwise. Okay, so this is really interesting, uh, the, the way this field is going, uh, that you know, uh, traditionally when you did uh, mathematics or simulation, 
you thought that you know uh, putting together an instrument is uh, very expensive, so you are trying to do uh, simulations. But today, uh, with these imaging ideas or algorithmic ideas, if you have a new idea, you can address a, a problem which is seemingly elementary. Uh, but then, uh, you know, if you can solve a problem, then it leads to a new instrument. Okay, so this is really uh, different. That it's not just. Uh, you are not trying to mimic a physical system computationally, but the possibility of solving a, you know a, a mathematical problem uh, uh, makes it possible to make a new kind of instrument. Okay? So this is uh, uh, an important point I want to emphasize. Finally, uh, this is my last slide uh, that uh, you know the uh, this phase uh, you know this is what is called as phase microscopy, high resolution phase microscopy that this uh, instrument allows. But when you actually develop a new idea, that also applies to uh, many different modalities of imaging. So we were recently able to apply this kind of ideas to uh, you know the uh, the micrographs from uh, electron microscope. Generally, uh, you know these uh, this is actually a single uh, macromolecule, and uh, this molecule is cylindrical. So some of the molecules are uh, sitting uh, cylindrically as a top view. Some of the molecules are you know uh, lying down horizontally. Typically, you know in electron microscope, the problem is that uh, you know. Uh, you know, the, the data is extremely noisy because you have to uh, keep uh, the the electron uh, level uh, that is there in the beam very low because if you uh, make the electron beam strong actually it is like uh, sending a current through these uh, macromolecules and uh, it will just destroy the sample okay so generally uh, when the light level is very low uh, or electron level here is very low or uh, you know in the case of astronomy, for example, the light is very weak. Uh, the images are generally very, very noisy and uh, getting information out of these uh, kind of images is very uh, difficult. But uh, we were able to recently demonstrate something interesting that uh, this kind of uh, very, very noisy images uh, like that, uh, they can lead to this kind of uh, you know, molecular, uh, macromolecular structure. And so uh, these algorithms, uh, once you develop for one modality, also have very important implications for other modalities as well. And so this is a, a very interesting ideas that uh, actually come out of uh, imaging research that uh, you know you look at one problem uh, and then uh, you know uh, it these ideas are generic to some extent and uh, they can be applied to other modalities and uh, it enables uh, another kind of advancement in science in a completely different problem. And so uh, this is uh, an example. These uh, particles, by the way, are really small. You see that this scale bar is just 30 nanometers. And so these structures that we are seeing here, uh, they are really uh, a few angstrom kind of level uh, resolution. And if you if you uh, want to be reminded, then uh, one angstrom is just one hydrogen atom. So you are kind of imaging at uh, this kind of very, very high resolution, atomic resolution kind of scale. <laughs> So I want to summarize the talk now, and uh, you know I discussed uh, many different ideas, and uh, you know how would you look at you know imaging as a research area or you know a field of study? There are two uh, definite directions you can uh, pursue that uh, you can actually think about uh, questioning the fundamental physics limits and uh, beat uh, conventionally perceived limits on the imaging performance. But in doing that, you know, you enable new devices which allow you to do, uh, you know, uh, a new kind of science. So, you know, so you can uh, improve resolution, speed, you know, get multidimensional information and things like that. And overall, uh, what happens is you observe objects or phenomena on a completely new set scale, and that uh, advances the science. So, uh, this is one area which is very, very important for advancing science with pictures. Uh, as I said, that if you can uh, picture, uh, you know, take a picture better tomorrow than uh, that contributes to uh, you know uh, gain in our knowledge about that object in itself. Second, uh, as I said, uh, you can question because of combining this uh, you know hardware and algorithms together, is that you know you can ask uh, you know on a different level you can ask this question that you know, are the so-called premium technologies really premium in terms of you know price per performance. Uh, you know, can uh, these ideas actually change uh, how, uh, you know, can we make simpler systems where the hardware, uh, the cost of putting together hardware is uh, low and there are algorithms that do some job. Uh, but, you know, the idea is, you know, uh, by doing this, we don't want to uh, reduce the performance. We want to match the performance of what is premium. Okay, so that is the uh, idea. Meaning we don't want to kind of say that we are making it here or so let's make it cheap or something. Meaning that is not a selling point anymore. You have to make it cheap uh, by some interesting new science or algorithm or mathematics or whatever. Uh, but you have to still match uh, performance with uh, what is premium. But you know if you can do that, uh, then it enables access to technologies. 
in various different areas and it has a very important social impact so in general you know making impact is important so either one of these uh, you can choose your path or you can you know even even your own uh, single career you can also do problems that are of different types and it's really enriching kind of field Finally, I want to say that, uh, you know, as you already see uh, from various examples, I discussed uh, that imaging is for everyone. So it is not just uh, for physicists or mathematics or, you know, it's all these things are involved. So uh, imaging is a theme, uh, you know, uh, the, the fact that I want to uh, have better pictures as a theme brings together everybody. So uh, you can be studying at a higher college level or university level or advanced level, uh, any of these areas, but uh, you can always encounter imaging systems in your work. And you can also contribute to uh, improving these uh, imaging systems. So uh, it's really interesting. We talk about interdisciplinary science, but uh, you know the theme of imaging in itself uh, is interdisciplinary. And all the things I showed you, you know, they are not just uh, done by mathematicians alone or physicists alone. But all these people, if they are not uh, coming together, uh, these systems will not actually happen, and so uh, the science will not be advanced. Okay, so here I want to stop. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, take any questions beyond this. Okay, thank you, Professor Khare, for the fantastic talk. And uh, we have learned many new things, many interesting topics related to optics and imaging. And it's very fascinating to see how we can uh, combine hardware, software, and of course our own creativity to process beautiful images and extract features. And I'm sure today's yeah. talk would uh, enrich, you know, all of you with science behind this these things. And next time when somebody, I mean, when you guys see a beautiful picture, then you'll certainly think differently. And uh, of course, at the end of the talk, Professor Kare talked about few open problems that need to be solved or that need more investigations. And I'm sure a few of you would come forward in the future and contribute to the next generation development, like either microscope development or algorithms and stuff like that. And that would take this whole uh, you know, subject to the next level. A uh, quick mention, I think Professor Kare is one of the developers of the digital holograph microscope, which is the world's cheapest microscope that can image living cells in three dimensions. So uh, that was something uh, very nice. And with this, uh, let's move on to the question answer session. And uh, we have our two PhD students, Mansi and Sunaina. Um, they will moderate this question answer session. So uh, thank you again, Professor Kare. And over to you, uh, Sunaina and Mansi. We have a few questions uh, from Webex as well as YouTube. So just, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so the first question is from Deepan. So the Deepan is asking, how is it possible for today's camera cameras to show images which are brighter than the actual object? OK, so uh, that is uh, an interesting question that uh, how to show that. So that is where uh, you know these algorithms come uh, into place. Uh, so uh, the camera, as you see, uh, you know, records something as a raw picture, but, uh, you know, uh, basically there are uh, ideas that are uh, going on behind in the processor uh, that actually, uh, you know, they are trained to, uh, you know, show you the images in a certain way. And uh, so it is just the work of these algorithms that, uh, you know, for example, these numbers are there, for example, right? That uh, in the beginning I talked about, uh, this kind of uh, model for camera, and uh, let's go there. <clears throat> for example, uh, here, uh, you know, you might have recorded, uh, this pixel may have uh, recorded 100 electrons, and this pixel may have recorded 1,000 electrons. And so when you read it out, then uh, you have a you know, matrix of numbers from each pixel. Uh, one pixel shows 10, other pixel shows 100. But now these are numbers, uh, I can do anything to them. I can take a square of them uh, and then uh, 10 will become 100 and 100 will become 10,000. And you know, if you try to display it on the screen, uh, it will actually become brighter than uh, what, you, uh, what, what was there in the reality. Uh, so you know, always I would say that uh, when you take pictures uh, you know, with uh, uh, you know, uh, these user-friendly kind of day-to-day uh, -day devices, uh, images are not often, uh, you know, they are uh, they are presented to you in a way that uh, some modification has already been done. Uh, they already have some internal uh, filters uh, that are applied to that, or some processing is already applied to that. And so, 
one should not uh, essentially use uh, mobile like cameras to do uh, scientific research, for example, you know, so they will not actually give you. So if you are interested in taking images, uh, which uh, out of which you want to generate uh, some quantitative information, then you have to uh, really uh, know whether uh, what is exactly being presented to you. Does that answer my question? Uh, sorry, my your question. Uh, yes, I hope uh, that will work. So the next next question is from Chandni Kumari. So she asks, uh, as you said, a, a MRI or CT scan machine can image a picture of organ deeply. How is it doing it actually? And how the light waves goes inside the body without cutting the organs? Yes. Uh, so, uh... To that, uh, what I would first of all uh, like to tell is uh, with uh, these systems, uh, it is not the light waves that are being used uh, to do this kind of imaging. Uh, with the CT machine, uh, you're actually sending X-rays through the person. Uh, with a MRI machine, uh, actually there are uh, these coils that operate at radio frequency. So uh, what happens is, you know, uh, what you're trying to image is uh, the magnetization of uh, the hydrogen nuclei in your body. Okay, so your uh, tissue actually is all uh, hydrocarbon, so hydrogen is there abundantly. And uh, what you do is uh, you, uh, you know, excite uh, the person uh, with, uh, meaning not a person, but uh, not in a uh, figurative way, but in a, you know, send a, a pulse of uh, radio frequency uh, radiation. Uh, and uh, you know that actually does something to the uh, you know the hydrogen nuclei uh, that actually flip, and uh, you can actually make this flip uh, uh, dependent on where the person is uh, in the magnetic field. So at different locations uh, in the uh, along this axis where the patient is lying down, uh, you can actually tune uh, you know the uh, what uh, radio frequency excitation is needed uh, to actually. Uh, uh, flip the hydrogen nuclear. So, you know, th this MRI is actually uh, actually based on a nuclear magnetic resonance. They don't use the nuclear word. Otherwise, people will be, uh, uh, you know, afraid of uh, going and taking a scan. But the point is that uh, it is playing uh, with the nuclear uh, magnetization of the atoms. And so, uh, you know, it's in some sense, these pulses are coded uh, in a spatially dependent way. And so uh, when uh, these hydrogen nuclei actually flip, uh, they generate another uh, radiation, which is then detected often by the same coils. And this data again, you know, it's is this data is again just numbers. And uh, but if you understand the physics behind it, uh, you can actually model uh, the image formation. Uh, and again, by solving this problem, uh, you can actually uh, make the image. As you see, X-rays actually can penetrate through your body. Similarly, MRI, uh, you know, the radio frequency pulses that are sent, they can also penetrate through your body. And so uh, that is why this is possible. With uh, light, uh, this is not possible. Uh, light cannot penetrate your skin uh, more than uh, uh, maybe at most a uh, few hundred micrometers. Okay. okay, so the next question which I'll be going to take is from Suryansh Rai. Suryansh, yes. uh, I am uh, unmuting you. You can directly ask your question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yes. So recently, NASA told that they have used salt lenses in James Webb telescope, which was launched uh, recently. Like, okay. so I wanted to understand, like, what exactly is salt lens and how does it work? And how is it different from normal lenses, which is used in it is not very different it is just the material essential okay so uh, salt may actually be uh, lighter to carry uh, and uh, so that is why it is but it is the principle wise it is uh, nothing different actually you just want to create a refractive index variation across the lens surface and that is still uh, is the same thing also, I don't exactly know uh, what wavelength range uh, they are using this uh, lens for. Uh, it could be a slightly different range of uh, wavelengths where, uh, you know, it is better to use that element compared to glass. Okay. Yeah. 
is there a next question nancy are you there yes um uh, so uh the next question is from ram haran so uh he is asking is it possible to get images of objects which is farther than 55 million light years in the near future with a fast developing technology yeah so uh, the thing is uh, yeah you could actually uh, you know, it's really uh, dependent you know if you want to still do exactly like uh, 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 phd uh, then you know probably uh, you know, if you want to go really farther than that uh, then you need even bigger telescope see the point is uh, if you think about your eye uh, you can resolve about uh, one arc minute okay uh, of uh, angles uh, because the aperture of your eye you know pupil is just uh, 2 or 3 mm if you go to uh, a larger telescope you know the the in, the resolution you can obtain is actually uh, inversely proportional to the size of your telescope in general and so larger the telescope you can make uh, the larger uh, you know finer resolution you can get and so that you can resolve objects that are uh, farther and farther away now if you want to really double the distance or make it 10 times uh, you know uh, let's just talk about doubling the distance you know so the thing is uh, this telescope synthetically is already of the size of earth and so if you want to double that uh, then you have to float these antennas in space and so there is already uh, some program that the european and nasa european agencies and nasa already are thinking about where you know these six uh, uh, antennas will be there on earth uh, but you can also carry some antennas on a uh, on a uh, space uh, orbit and so uh, data from here as well as data from the uh, space orbiting antennas the the bigger you can go uh, the finer your resolution will be okay so uh, but you know as you can see already uh, putting these uh, things into uh, on you know huge antenna arrays at different uh, locations is already expensive uh, floating these antennas in uh, space will be even more expensive so it's actually somewhere you have to also do uh, you know uh, the bigger the project gets like that it is also costly and it also takes time so uh, you know it cannot happen in a uh, time scale of one year or two years uh, but it can happen maybe on a time scale of 20 30 years but if you start now maybe in 30 years that kind of thing can be realized you know and so bigger and bigger uh, synthetic aperture you can get. Uh, why I'm calling this as a synthetic aperture is that, you know, a, a single uh, antenna is not as large as Earth, uh, but by distributing these antennas uh, synthetically, uh, you are uh, handling the data in such a way that effectively uh, the size of this uh, whole telescope is uh, typically of the size of this Earth. So if you can make it bigger, float some of these antennas in space in a stable manner. Uh, yes, then it is possible to do that. So, Mansi, may I quickly read out one question? So, somebody has asked, uh, what are the pixels of eyes? I guess it's 576 megapixel, right? So, is that correct? Yes. yes. Human eyes. Those are the, you know, the rods and cones of retina uh, okay. that are in your eyes. Uh, those are color sensitive. They are also, uh, you know, uh, sensitive to uh, light and, you know, uh, this kind of thing. So, the, uh, the, the pixels in your eye, uh, are essentially uh, the rods and cones uh, that are in the retina. Okay. Otherwise, it's just a lens. But you know, the eye lens is quite special because uh, you know uh, it's not very easy to get a camera lens that uh, can quickly change focus. You know, your eyes are changing focus uh, almost instantly when you. So right now, if you are looking at screen and you look somewhere else, you focus almost instantly. Uh, but we don't have many lenses like that uh, made, you know. So somehow uh, this, the eye muscles, uh, you know, the muscles on the lens uh, have learned to do this. Uh, it's really an amazing feat of nature. Yeah, that you... <laughs> we realize every day, I think, just looking far and near. Science. Yes, yes. So meaning we take it for granted, but you know, some a lot of complex things are happening uh, for us to visualize things. True. And those of you who are thinking that your mobile phone has like 20 megapixel. 12, 20 something, but we have 600 almost close to human eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Mansi, please go ahead and uh, read the next question. So the next question is from Asta, and she's asking, uh, what is the advantage of cryo-electron microscope over electron microscope? 
Okay, the cryo part is only to uh, cool down these particles. So if you have a material kind of sample, you know, silicon film or some other material, maybe you don't need to cool down like that. Uh, what you're doing in the cryo microscope is that, uh, you know, uh, these viruses are actually floating in water or any other liquid that is around. And uh, so these viruses, as you see, are really, really, or viruses or macromolecules, they are really, really tiny. Uh, you know, as I said, this is just 30 nanometers across. And so if you uh, if you have learned a little bit about Brownian motion, uh, what you will see is that, you know, these are not going to sit stationary and they are just keep going to uh, vibrating all the time and just going to diffuse through the liquid. So if you want to actually image them, you want to hold them. But, you know, uh, you don't have a... Uh, you know, a, a pair of tweezers kind of things that can hold them in one place. There are optical tweezers, but you know, uh, these are really, really tiny particles. And uh, so the the cryo part of it uh, is actually about you know freezing these particles uh, to uh, really uh, you know uh, liquid helium kind of temperatures, so that you know they become stationary. They are still moving, uh, but you know at least uh, you can handle that uh, small motion. Uh, so that is the main difference. I think uh, the next lecture in March is going to be uh, about cryo-electron microscopy by Professor Manidipa. And I think I urge you to uh, listen to that lecture. She will explain all these things uh, in detail. Okay, okay. Uh, the next question is um, Sw from Swastik Mishra. Uh, he he is asking how can we get a blurred part and a focused part in the same picture with the same camera? Yeah, so uh, the 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 principle I showed you uh, is kind of uh, interesting. That uh, with a traditional lens, uh, you cannot do that, as you know. Uh, you know, if you take a picture with a microscope or a camera. You know, different objects are at different depths. Uh, it is not possible to do that. But what I'm showing you here is a, a new kind of uh, system where uh, actually uh, there is some sort of a coded mask. What is this coded mask? It is some sort of an exotic uh, glass element. Uh, its surface uh, takes either a cubic uh, profile, uh, you know, with a precision of uh, wavelength, uh, you know, accuracy, or there is uh, another complicated functions, uh, you know. Uh, logarithm of uh, radius and things like that. So there are several designs of that, uh, but you have to uh, fabricate these uh, surfaces uh, to a precise uh, degree. So, you know, this kind of thing, as I said, uh, it, there is a precision engineering involved to make those kind of masks or coding elements that you insert into your traditional system. So your traditional system uh, does not uh, have that capability. But uh, once you put this into that system, what you can do is uh, here, uh, you know, as you see in the first picture, uh, you know, uh, things at different depths, you know, if I stop it here, what you see is, uh, you know, this, but uh, when you actually put this kind of coding element into that uh, microscope, what happens is uh, you actually generate a picture where uh, the blurring uh, at all the different depths is made uh, almost uh, similar to each other. It's not exactly similar, uh, but it is nearly depth independent. So you can see that everything uh, looks blurred. Uh, if you just looked at it through this uh, viewfinder, you will see just a blurred image, actually. Uh, but the point is, uh, once you actually have a, a depth independent blur, uh, you see that already these small features are uh, there uh, at all depths, they are blurred equally. And so, uh, you know, if you try to do a sh uh, image sharpening or deblurring, uh, you know, those algorithms assume that uh, blurring is similar everywhere. And so if you can apply uh, the traditional image processing algorithms, like uh, removing the blur uh, on, you know, if you try to do it on this image, what will happen is, you know, some part may get improved, some part may get, may not get improved. Uh, but by doing this, if you make the blur independent of depth of the sample, uh, then you can achieve this. So uh, very interesting ideas go into this kind of, uh, you know, extended uh, depth of field kind of systems. Okay. Yeah. Now I'll be going to unmute Yesh so you can directly ask your question. Yes. Um. So it seems. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir, uh, if yes. we see a particular color, is this color is seen same by everyone or uh, everyone see different color and name it uh, the same like we call app. 
red is this color is red for everyone or different for everyone uh, that is a very interesting question uh, it is also uh, very complex to answer now uh, there are two things that are happening when you see the uh, red color uh, something uh, is happening in your brain uh, for you to interpret uh, that it is red in a way that you have been trained to call it red uh, for all these years uh, since your childhood. Now, the question is, you know, uh, if everyone learns in their own ways and uh, then calls the same sense, whatever sensation is there in the brain, it is interpreted as red, then everybody agrees. But the point is, uh, you know, uh, if does everybody have similar sensation or simulation in the brain, uh, that is probably not true. Uh, and this is really profound that, uh, you know, it's, it's the same thing for anything, not just the color. Uh, you call a number one uh, because, you know, your brain uh, interprets that in some ways. But in detail, uh, what happens in, in your brain or your friend's brain or uh, your uh, father's brain, you know, th those things are probably completely different. And uh, we, it's a very important, profound problem. And uh, I think uh, at least I don't know the answer to it, uh, but I believe that it is uh, not going to be the same sensation in everybody's brain. Although uh, because of our training, uh, we are taught to call it the same name. So that is great because otherwise there will be a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, in fact, this AI based techniques also the machine learning stuff like that. There also we train the machine to learn something. Yes. yes. So different training modalities can have uh, different, uh, you know, uh, the specific models that get developed can be different uh, in individuals brain. So you can see that this is a very complex problem. Learning anything uh, by brain uh, is a very, very complex problem. It's definitely uh, a new front, uh, you know, uh, it is already explored a lot, but it is still a lot of unknown things are there and it is really a, uh, an, an unexplored frontier. And uh, Meaning it's just that uh, we don't have enough tools available to uh, find out everything. But, you know, again, uh, some of these studies that uh, try to see what the brain is learning, uh, they are again uh, done via uh, the MRI machine. Actually. So functional MRI and things like that. Uh, those are some of the tools to address that. Uh, at least one of the tools that uh, allows you to uh, just try to understand. I mean, we are really scratching the surface, uh, but uh, uh, at least uh, people have, for several decades now, people have already started exploring this. Uh, but it's really a complex problem. So, uh, the next question is from Lavanya. She is yeah. asking, what is the benefit of using Plenoptic camera? and what are some of its major uses? Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, it's really nice if you can do this. Uh, now, once you can do this, uh, you think about how many places you focus your camera, okay? So just imagine that you uh, actually are just buying something today, uh, just scanning a QR code, and, uh, you know, you have to wait, you know, you actually uh, see that you actually try to uh, let your camera focus first. If it was a planoptic camera, you, well, planoptic camera cannot be made that small, but uh, still, it was a planoptic camera, you don't need to focus, don't need to worry about focusing, and uh, you can uh, make the focus happen after the picture has been taken. Also, sometimes if you have dynamic events, for example, a moving object uh, that you want to image, you know, so uh, there is, a, it's very difficult to focus in a short time. And so a planoptic camera can actually do that, uh, that, uh, you know, just one example is, uh, you know, the cameras installed on uh, signals, you know, you want to find out uh, which car is speeding and which car is not speeding. You want to image the number plate and, uh, you know, it's a uh, uh, very, uh, it could be very nice if you don't have to worry about focusing uh, at any stage. You just take a picture and then uh, later on you focus onto the number plate. So these are just a couple of examples I gave you, but you know, it's also important for microscopy. It's also important, you know, uh, many, many imaging systems uh, can benefit uh, from uh, this kind of uh, possibility. Next question I'll be going to take from Savit. So, um... He is asking, there is a feature in Photoshop and many other visual editing softwares where one can remove the subject from the image and can expose the underlying 
background of the subject without warping the rest of the image sir yeah. how is it possible it is possible to the extent that you can be deceived okay so <laughs> if you don't feel the difference that uh, photoshop has uh, won uh, but uh, definitely uh, in a normal photography you cannot see behind anything opaque uh, but uh, you can learn uh, to fill the space and the better you learn it, uh, maybe it, there is just grass around it and you just fill it with a similar texture and so that you don't feel the difference. It's uh, really not possible to do it uh, by just image processing. Okay, so there is no physics uh, which will say that there is an opaque object like a person. Uh, you just remove that, uh, you know, everything behind that will be uh, visible. You know, you can, uh, it's basically just trying to fool uh, the user. Okay, that's all. <laughs> And so if you agree to it, that's great. If you don't agree, maybe there will be case. I will uh, suggest you that uh, try to make, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, specific cases where this kind of thing will fail. Okay? So you can possibly think of making such uh, examples. Okay, It cannot uh, learn everything for sure. sure. Uh, now I will uh, ask you I will take two more questions. Uh, so so the question is from Sashur Tripathi. So he's asking, what is the difference between JPEG and RAW? Okay. So uh, RAW is something uh, which does not try to, you know, it just saves the numbers as it is, uh, does not do much to the numbers. And JPEG is uh, one where, uh, so let us say, uh, let us think about it this way, that uh, suppose, uh, we have a coding mechanism to write the image. So image, you can think of it as a, a two dimensional function uh, of coordinates X and Y of the pixels, okay? So you can think of uh, the image as a two dimensional function and you try to code it, for example. And uh, now you have a different uh, numbers uh, after coding it. Uh, so JPEG is a coding mechanism, okay? So, you try to represent the image in such a way that, uh, you know, these uh, ideas that, you know, there is a structure, there is a smoothness, there is a edges, those informations are actually, actually uh, put together mathematically uh, in some coding mechanism. And then what you do is uh, uh, basically once it has been coded uh, in a new representation, uh, so instead of pixel values, you will have uh, some uh, coding coefficients. And then what you do is uh, all this, you decide what is small and what is large in those coefficients and all the small ones, you just turn to zero. Okay, and that is JPEG. And uh, then you only send the large uh, coding coefficients to other party or uh, other user. And then uh, at the other end, they will try to regenerate. And in such a way that, you know, uh, meaning uh, you uh, omit those uh, small coefficients uh, or small uh, coding numbers, such that uh, you know once the image is regenerated uh, it is very difficult for uh, another user to see a difference in the normal photography okay so if you are doing something really fine uh, then you could actually notice difference but you know on a mobile screen which is already small uh, things are not uh, that high resolution or uh, you know all the fine details even if they are not uh, saved uh, you know you will still not see too much of a difference but if you are going to you know project this image on a large screen which is uh, three feet by three feet then all those small things that are missing uh, they will uh, really show up so it depends on uh, what is the visual application where you are using it and depending on that you can also decide uh, the coding scheme or you know which uh, coding numbers you have to uh, make zero so instead of you know uh, one million numbers maybe this image is represented by means of uh, say hundred thousand numbers and out of 100,000, maybe 50,000 are really small. So you just make them zero. And then uh, rest of the 50,000, which are significant, uh, you save them in the form of uh, what is known as the JPEG image. Okay, so that is the uh, difference. In RAW, you won't like to do anything like that. Or at least, you know, you would not like to uh, throw out uh, as many numbers. In JPEG, you would like to throw out much more numbers uh, than even what is possible in that coding. So this will be the last question, which will be uh, taking from WebEx. So Sachin, you can ask your question directly. Sir, my question is that how is the electrical signal is converted into a picture in optical fiber? 
optical fiber? Uh, are you talking about things like endoscope? In optical fiber, electrical signal is not uh, being converted to light. Meaning, uh, so are you asking about how the optical communication is done uh, when you is want that your to, question? When you want to send image from one to another? Let us answer it in some ways, at least. Uh, so first of all, as I said, uh, that the picture is converted into numbers uh, by reading out these charges that are stored in different pixels. These numbers are encoded on some uh, light waves uh, by either the principle of, you know, you have probably, uh, maybe if you are in class 11 or 12, you might have heard of uh, frequency modulation and amplitude modulation and things like that. So that information is encoded on the light waves. Uh, sometimes it can be digital, which means you can say a pulse is one and no pulse is zero, and that is another way to uh, kind of uh, encode information. Uh, but you know those numbers have to be sent from one side to other side in some ways uh, by a protocol that is agreed on by uh, the transmission side and uh, the receiver side. And so again on the other side, uh, they will receive those numbers uh, and then again put them together uh, in the form of a picture, okay, on a screen, so that a human can again uh, see those numbers in the form of a picture. Hopefully, uh, that uh, answers your question. Yeah, maybe Sunaina can take a few questions. So uh, from YouTube audience, uh, first question is from uh, Vaishnavi Singh. So uh, yeah. she is asking, what is the difference between modern and traditional microscopes? So uh, when I talked about modern and uh, uh, traditional, uh, what I meant was like this. Again, let me go back to this uh, slide. Uh, so. Uh, in the traditional ways of microscopy, uh, you know, there is a lens objective, there is a tube lens, and, you know, there is a standard design uh, which has been perfected over uh, hundreds of years, few hundred years, and you actually uh, take a sample, illuminate it, and form a picture. And so uh, that, you know, whether you record the picture uh, on a film or view it through a viewfinder or uh, record it on a camera and see it on a computer, uh, from the imaging physics perspective, all these things are essentially same because you know the image is formed directly from uh, the sample to the whichever sensor that is there. Whereas uh, when we think of modern systems or microscopes, uh, you know the image is not meaning they still have uh, some of these optical components and they still record something on the uh, you know some kind of uh, data on the sensor. But uh, what I would call as uh, things that are like super resolution, which beat you know, uh, the limits that are existing for last few hundred years, what is recorded on the sensor directly through this microscopy system, if you try to uh, just uh, read out those images and try to look at them uh, visually, uh, you will not get that additional information of super resolution or beating the diffraction limit. So uh, what it means is that uh, the overall system performance of uh, giving you this uh, higher resolution is possible only if uh, this multiple uh, records of images and algorithm uh, work together. So at the uh, traditional systems, uh, essentially, uh, you know, the optics ended at this camera. Okay, so optics uh, already uh, recorded a good image, and then uh, you did whatever uh, you wanted with the image. But now. What I would say is that uh, the optics uh, or the system doesn't end there, meaning the image is not available at the stage of the camera. Uh, the image that is meaningful that you want to uh, recover is available only after the algorithm. And uh, so this is a little bit tricky sometimes. People worry about these kind of issues that, you know, if I'm going to diagnose somebody with these images, are these algorithms reliable in some sense? If they are not reliable, then you will end up doing something wrong. So in any application, you want to put such ideas together, uh, you know, uh, in the old times, if once you uh, made the microscope, uh, you could actually uh, do the same thing for another kind of sample, another kind of meaning, uh, you know, uh, from sample to sample, you didn't have to worry about, you know, what the algorithm is doing. There is no particular algorithm here. The image is already formed on the camera. But here now you have to worry a little bit that, you know, uh, you have to see what kind of samples you're interested in, what is the eventual application? 
is the algorithm you have designed actually giving you uh, giving the user that information you know the user may be a doctor for example in a mri uh, kind of system and uh, the point is they are not aware of what algorithm has gone into it what physics has gone into it they just want to look at the picture uh, they are very good at identifying uh, whether something is wrong or everything is normal uh, but you know uh, the point is uh, you need to develop these algorithms responsibly and you know uh, it's not just about you know doing some fancy maths it is the user also gets integrated into it in uh, you have to do large number of tests uh, to develop a confidence that uh, you know that uh, what we are doing is correct and so uh, the things are different uh, in that sense that uh, you know how we handle the whole system uh, is quite different in the traditional versus me okay i hope i answered this question correctly so uh, next question is from uh, gautam jaitley so he is asking sir how much does it cost to make such a microscopes um it does cost uh, a lot uh, sometimes it depends on uh, what you want to do uh, it can cost uh, anywhere between a uh, few tens of thousands to few crores okay so uh, it's not uh, there is no standard answer uh, it depends on what you want to do i think uh, you know uh, in science generally people say that we will not worry about money but uh, i think money is always finite in the world so depending on what you want to do for a particular application you have to also uh, worry about money that how much it is going to cost so you know if i want to develop a diagnostic toolkit for a pathology lab i cannot simply charge uh, because my science is good i cannot charge 5 crores because it will not be affordable uh, so uh, you know not everything is possible to do everywhere uh, and uh, these things are very important and they go into uh, consideration when the systems are designed so uh, you can uh, meaning i cannot give you a specific example like this but uh, you know a super resolution microscope today is a somewhat newer technology it may cost a uh, few crores uh, but you know uh, it i'm not saying that it will always cost that much meaning something new might happen uh, 20 years later it may not cost that much and uh, something else will be costing uh, more so in terms of you know price uh, uh, sometimes you know what is actually charged to you and uh, what is the actual cost of uh, making it they could be very different sometimes so newer technologies that perform uh, better than what is there uh, already existing then they can actually cost sometimes higher but also if you have made some innovations uh, like our uh, phase microscope that i showed you the 3d microscope uh, where uh, principally something else was done uh, so we are not losing performance but uh, you know the whole principle of uh, extraction of this phase was changed and uh, that way it costs uh, maybe uh, uh, much less about five times less than what it would otherwise cost so there is uh, you know the science and uh, the uh, you know the hardware part and the computation part all these things are playing together in decision of the uh, you know how much it costs uh, you know the, the, i am not talking about any business considerations they could also be there uh, for companies which are uh, manufacturing such things so pricing is a complex issue but uh, typically uh, that is how uh, what i would say but anybody will be foolish to actually try to price something at a, a point which the user cannot really afford so uh, for whatever application you are developing so if you are trying to develop something uh, which is a unique system which is only a big organization or university can afford uh, one of it you know as a shared facility for everybody then maybe a few crores is uh, considerable considered to be a reasonable price because you know hundreds of users are probably going to use it but if you are going to do it for something else you know for a uh, you know it depends on what you want to do with that imaging system and uh, for example the eht must have cost uh, in billions for example you know so uh, this is uh, depends on uh, what you want to do and uh, whether uh, you can convince people also it's an important question that people who want to do it uh, should also be able to convince uh, uh, others uh, in the society that you know there is really some value uh, in what they are doing and that is also an interesting an important aspect of doing science yeah i mean in health science i think we you have a lot of stuff no that uh, yes common people use it but uh, they they don't even know what would be the cost of this mri machine <laughs> Yeah. yes so i think we have to be realistic uh, we have to be uh, 
meaning these points are you know because i am a scientist i should not say that i cannot worry about it it is very important uh, aspects yeah. if you are trying to make a device uh, that uh, you want other people to use then uh, that is also going to play a role but you know what i want to kind of say is uh, we should not as a country just say that you know we are in india our uh, you know salaries to uh, engineers are less and then uh, we can use cheaper components and do some jugad and th that is not the way to uh, actually reduce cost meaning it may have worked for some time but you know that is not uh, going to make us competitive if the cost can be reduced because uh, we do better science then uh, that is what we want you know going forward and uh, it is happening already and uh, that is how things will go and particularly for uh, bright students who want to get into science that is what they should focus on that is what i would say true and that's that's some purpose that would be served from this talk some of yes. the guys will come forward <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, Manthi. The question uh, is from Anurag. Uh, he's yes. asking that uh, from where the noise in an image comes from. Yes. So very, very interesting question. And uh, let me kind of give you a small, uh, meaning I cannot actually explain everything uh, because uh, it's a, a noise itself is an advanced topic, but let us kind that I showed in the beginning. Uh, so here, the, here is the uh, the noise coming from. There are multiple uh, ideas from where uh, multiple uh, you know modalities from where the noise comes from. So first of all, light itself. Okay. So uh, when you uh, turn on a, a light bulb or a laser, uh, and if you try to count how many number of photons are there in the beam, uh, you know you may have a detector which can count uh, photons like a photomultiplier tube. And let's suppose you do an experiment where uh, you try to measure number of photons coming in uh, from the beam, uh, say every one nanosecond or one microsecond or something like that. If you try to measure these uh, number of photons, you will see that every uh, measurement actually does not generate the same number because uh, you know uh, there is actually a variability in the number of photons that are arriving. Okay, so that is because of the statistical nature of source. Because we don't have any sources. If you think about where the light is getting generated, uh, it is getting generated out of atoms. And so that is itself, uh, you know, generation of light is a statistical process. So it is never a constant number. <laughs> number two, uh, you know, uh, there may be other aspects that every photon that is coming onto the detector is not actually getting detected. So maybe only 50% of them are getting detected. Others are not actually getting detected. Maybe they are uh, reflecting off or they are just uh, getting absorbed and generate heat and not uh, really uh, create electrons. Now, uh, that is the, another thing that, uh, you know, the ones which are detected are making electrons maybe, and then uh, those electrons have to be read out in a circuit. And uh, whenever you have a circuit, uh, it is, uh, and it is at room temperature, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, there is a fluctuation in the current because there is temperature out there. So if you want to really make a sensitive camera, you have to uh, dip this electronics into some liquid nitrogen or something like that to reduce that uh, variability. So noise here is really variability uh, in the, uh, you know, what you read out. So even if all the conditions are same, and if you read out uh, numbers and uh, you know uh, nominal evening conditions are same, all the physical phenomena that are involved in uh, you know generation of light, detection of light, reading out the signal, all of them have some statistical fluctuation on top of it. And as a result, uh, if you uh, even if you nominally arrange the experiment uh, same and take multiple data points, you will see that uh, you know every time you don't get the same number, but uh, there is some distribution around it. You know, so there will be some mean number of, uh, uh, you know, what is an average number that will be recorded in a pixel, and then around that there will be a fluctuation or distribution. Uh, what you can do at most is to control that distribution. You cannot make that uh, fluctuation completely zero ever. Uh, at least right now we don't know how to do that. Meaning we don't know a, a source where you know you just press a button and it will generate one photon. You know, so things are not so deterministic. And so that is why, uh, you know, uh, these fluctuations in what you measure, uh, that is the source of noise. But noise is coming from various sources, not just uh, one particular thing. Okay. So shall we um, stop here or? Yeah, we can stop now. Uh, and I people 
always uh, contact uh, us uh, we are on the web always so you yes. can uh, check our emails you want to send more questions uh, i may not answer immediately but uh, at least i will try to answer yeah that's good so uh, th thank you uh, again professor khare mansi and sunaina thank for you. for a wonderful uh, you know the question answer session i'm sure I mean, they have many questions but those questions will you know bring them to to a, to a stage where they can at explore. least i hope that uh, we get them thinking yes yes exactly <laughs> that is very important that's true okay so with that let me uh, now uh, thank the organizers of this uh, beautiful event uh, first of all uh, professor pritha chandra department of uh, humanities and social science this is of the dean and dean's outreach program and we thank many uh, more people like Professor Jay, Professor Ravi, Professor Rajendran, Professor Somik Siddhanta, Professor Divya Nair, Gaurav, and uh, our video image production team. I mean, they are the backbones yeah. of you know the, the whole event, and uh, there are many helping hands you know, behind yes, our sure. successful event. And then we'd like to thank the all the deans and the director uh, Professor Ram Gopal Rao, um, and the entire team for making this event so successful. And uh, special mention to various electronic and print media for uh, circulating our program and helping us to reach out to a larger audience. And uh, so we are going to have many more uh, you know, lectures of this type under yeah. the site oh. uh, initiative. And of course, and we have already mentioned that we are going to have the next one on cryo EM, you know, how it uh, kind of uh, helped biologists and many other people to, to understand complex uh, systems. Yes. And uh, yeah, so uh, last uh, but not the least, uh, we'd like to thank you all of you uh, for your active participation. And uh, um, with this, uh, again, one more time, we thank Professor Kare for a fantastic talk. And, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I have uh, personally, I learned a lot. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Sir. And then we look forward to having you all in the future talks as well. And yeah. uh, so with that, uh, we conclude today's session and take care and uh, be safe. And thank yes. you all. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, Charlie. Bye.